Thank you. Uh, first, thanks for, a lot for the invitation. Um, yeah. We organized once an OWASP uh, meeting in, uh, in our place, and we, we didn't bring that many people. That's very nice to, to see. Um, OK, so uh, my name is Aurélien Francillon, as you uh, spelled pre pretty well. Um, uh, I'm an assistant professor in um, Eurecom. Uh, Eurecom is um, an engineering school. Uh, we're a small engineering school, or graduate school, if you want. So um, we're located near Nice, actually between Nice and Cannes, uh, in a place called Sophia Antipolis, if you know. Um, and we're a graduate school, which means that we only teach to master level and PhD level students, right? So we have a PhD program on, uh, we do uh, research on, uh, on teaching as well on the topics of uh, networking security, multimedia, on uh, mobile communications, like uh, GSM communications, if you want. Um, so this is a very focused uh, institute. Well, it's pretty small as well. We have about 20, 23 faculty in total. Um, OK, uh, and uh, so with uh, my colleague, David Balzarotti, we, uh, we together run what we call the Software and System Security Group. Uh, so we are basically a group where we're interested in, in looking at um, real world problems in real world systems, right? Uh, and we work with this uh, aspect of trying to sometimes find new vulnerabilities, new problems, or find new defenses, or just study, right? Study the, the problems, right? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we work on many different topics, right? Um, so uh, actually, um, I'm going to tell you about our web activities, but the real expert on the web in the group is Rada Davide Balzarotti, my colleague. But uh, some of this work um, that's going to be presented today is actually the work of both David Canali, a former PhD student from the group, and David Balzarotti. Um, so the first half is, about, is going to be about uh, web onipots that they did together. Uh, I thought it would be nice to present to you, even if I didn't really contribute that myself. Uh, first, I know it anyway. Um, but because then it's a very good introduction for, for the second part I'm going to tell you about. So the first part uh, is about really a honeypot we built that is the goal is to collect attacks, to receive attacks, right? And then to analyze the attacks, to see what happens, what the attackers that break into web applications really do. Um, second, uh, I will tell you uh, about a study we did uh, where I actually contributed to that one uh, for real where we actually look at uh, whether the, the web hosting services, in particular the cheap ones, the shared web hosting services, what they do for, for, for the security of your website. Right? You know that those web hostings that are already deployed like very cheap and by like small home pages, small business and so on. So there are really a ton of them, right? And uh, what happens to those? Uh, because they are not experts that deploy them, right? So uh, what's happening there? And uh, is there anything done for, for the security? Um, so I'm going to, so this, this gives at the end this awkward title, uh, an analysis of exploitation behaviors on the web on the role of web hosting providers in detecting them. And that's actually a combination of this first part, uh, uh, behind the scene of online attacks and analysis of exploitation behaviors on the web. Um, so really the, the, the motivation there, uh, we started this uh, really to study what, what, uh, what is done by the web attackers, right? Uh, you have some, you know there are a ton of problems, security problems. We, we just saw the previous talk telling you all the things you shouldn't do, right? All the things you need to care about. And uh, well, what we'll see now is really what happens when you have websites with big uh, flaws or defects uh, um, that can be abused by attackers, right? And they are actually abused a lot. Right? So uh, we want to know, once we know they are abused, right? But there have been little studies looking at what happens, what, what the attackers are actually doing once they break into, what, what, what is the first thing they do, right? Um, so <coughs> this is really the previous web of Nipots that, that were um, run or that we know of. They were mostly um, first looking at the attacks and stopping, right? Not letting the attacker do anything, right? So we go a bit further. We let actually the attacker break into and do some stuff. We, we kind of limit them in what they can do, but we, we do this enough to, to, to see what is done. You will see how. So we actually um, uh, had to deploy an infrastructure for that. So the infrastructure we deployed was uh, based on um, a number of websites, vulnerable websites that we deploy on the internet. And it's mostly done uh, by, uh, so we registered 100 domain names. 
those 100 domain names, we made five uh, websites, um, subdomains, uh, four subdomains, which makes five uh, per domain. So that's four, uh, 500 uh, vulnerable websites in total, which are hosting uh, those web pages. They're hosted on nine different web hosting um, uh, providers. Uh, so that there is some diversity, some geographic diversity. And inside those websites, we actually install vulnerable applications, right? So we have five CMS uh, that are vulnerable in some way. So there is a blog, a forum, an e-commerce uh, web application, um, some generic portal, an SQL manager, and so on. There is one static website, seven PHP web, web shells, right? And then with all this installed, so each, each um, domain name has several websites. Uh, we, we, we see what, what's happening there. So um, when we do this, uh, so we did deploy this for 100 days. So I'm just talking about this first data set that we published a bit so, quite some time ago. We, we still continue this, uh, this work, right? We still have this running. Uh, we're, we're collaborating with a Trend Micro, for example, on this. Um, we still, uh, so David Canali that did fir this first work is gone. No, he's working at last line. Uh, but uh, no, there is another PhD student working on this. And there is some, I mean, there will be some new stuff as well on this. So this is really, an experiment we've been running for years now. Uh, but this is about, today the data I'll show is about the first 100 days of running this. Um, this is actually a lot of uh, engineering work on effort to run this, so it's, it's kind of uh, some efforts. Um, so what, what we did is, um, it would have been a bit awkward to deploy all those websites uh, very on different hosting services and so on. Uh, so, so to simplify the thing, um, uh, we, we actually, uh, on those nine hosting providers, we only put some web proxy, right? So the attacker doesn't know, but when he's actually going on one of these domains, he's actually redirected to our own um, uh, virtual machines, right? So in our own um, server room. <coughs> so um, basically how it's working, uh, each uh, website is redirecting to one virtual machine. And then uh, we, we um, can take snapshots of the virtual machines. We can analyze the file systems. So every day we restart the virtual machine and make a different uh, a diff of the file system, collect the files that have been uploaded and so on, right? <coughs> uh, so inside those virtual machines, it's kind of easy to limit the, the attacker's capabilities. Uh, we make some, we block the networking. Um, we can re reset them so they, if, they get, if they compromise the machine after some time, they can't use it anymore. <clears throat> okay, and then because they're virtual machines, we get, we get the complete log of, of the attack. <clears throat> so um, we collected quite a bit of data, uh, about 10 gigabytes of uh, raw HTTP requests. Um, in average, there was uh, about between 1 and 10,000 uploaded files uh, every day by the attackers, uh, on between 100 and 200,000 uh, HTTP requests per day. Um, we found that the first suspicious activities in general happen like two hours after the deployment. Um, and uh, we have the first manual attackers after four hours of the deployment, right? Uh, and this is like the, the rate of um, uh, the, the attacks over the, I think that's over the 100 days. Um, and in blue, this is just the, the normal crawler. So that's Yahoo, Google, and so on, right? And this is the, the potentially the attackers. Um, so we classify the data by um, the source, right? So by the IP addresses. So uh, we found that uh, most of the IPs uh, source were coming from USA and Russia on Ukraine. So Ukraine is actually uh, a big uh, source of traffic. Um, and that's again excluding the, the known crawlers. So uh, once we got all this data, we, we have to perform some data analysis. So um, first we, we try to find how uh, the attacker are discovering um, uh, the services. Uh, we we actually put some, some links um, on the internet pointing to those services, so they get indexed by the crawlers, right? And we found that um, uh, uh, we look at the, the, the referrers or the docs that, that were used by the attackers. Um, <coughs> about 70 about 70 percent of the attacks they, they start by. Uh, a crawler, right? Uh, a bot that is going to crawl the website uh, to do first uh, discovery phase. Um, then uh, we see that there is a reconnaissance phase, right? Looking at, at the different pages. 
Um, and this is launched by a second uh, automated system uh, that is not hiding itself, uh, it's a user agent. Uh, then we have the exploitation phase um, that's exploiting the, 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 the vulnerable web application. Um, on like almost half of them is, are, are using, a, um, are uploading a web shell. Um, and after the exploitation, what happens? So we'll see uh, like um, the steps that are done uh, by the attacker, and that's very often a manual uh, attack. Um, so uh, the discovery, uh, we look at uh, basically the, the referrer, uh, so half of the case, there is the referrer, right? So, so the crawler, we know it's coming from Google, Yahoo, and so on, right? So mostly by search engine queries. Um, that could be fact. Maybe if they are left there, maybe they are still uh, true. Um, <coughs> and we see a few um, more black, um, uh, black hat uh, search engines as well uh, in the referrer. Um, so we get some webmail services in the refer uh, or social networks, and maybe this is because we have some spam on phishing pages, and maybe this is victims of, of that. Um, <coughs> uh, then we see that most of the traffic is from automated systems. Uh, we guess this is the case because there is no image or still sheet that are downloaded. It's just a, um, like it seems to be really automated thing, and uh, some some of them are faking the user agents there. Uh, I mean, we, they are faking the, um, the, the user agent of known web crawlers. Um, for example, we know if they say Google bots, uh, we see they come from an IP address that is not owned by Google. Uh, it's suspicious. Huh? <coughs> so uh, then uh, we analyze the, the actual attack phase, right? Uh, so we know first that the application is vulnerable, so it's not a surprise. The, the attack is not a surprise. We know the attack they, they use. Um, so we see uh, more than 400 uh, exploitation sessions, um, a session being a number of um, connections within uh, some, some time from the same source. Uh, many of them rely on, on Perl uh, and on, uh, actually are automated. Um, <coughs> half of them are using web shells uh, and then um, uh, installing, web, uploading web shells. Um, so there is all sort of um, um, phishing files loaded. Uh, I think the on, on that uh, script there. I guess it's not very clear. This uh. okay. So um, another uh, kind of attack because we have different websites. So we have a forum that is deployed as well. And this forum is not really vulnerable to anything particular. It's just a forum that is deployed. Uh, on in average, uh, there was like. Uh, almost 2,000 registrations per day, uh, uh, hundreds of posts on hundreds of online users every day. Uh, those forums were nothing in there, right? They were just only abused. Uh, there was probably no legitimate user there because there were probably nothing interesting to see, uh, apart from a lot of spam uh, emails or spam links. Um, <coughs> one, um, so one, one third of, of those uh, um, accounts uh, never posted any messages on, on we think they, they were actually uh, resold uh, so we, we think that there were some ac people actually some, some IP addresses were found to register a lot of accounts and then later on we find that uh, those accounts are uh, used to post uh, spam messages but they were used by another IP address right so we assume that there are some people registering bulk accounts on different websites on that day, later on, um, later on, they actually sell this. Uh, and some, buy, some people actually buy the accounts in bulk and then use them for posting uh, advertisements, phishing pages, or doing a search engine optimization. Um, so the ge geographical trends of uh, the IP addresses, 36% uh, in the US, 24 in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, <coughs> Um, so, for the attack analysis, we see that uh, there is a, so we are able to sort of find a correlation of the manual attacks being uh, correlated with the, the time of the day. Um, we synchronize with the expect, I mean, with the 
the, the time zone we expect from the attacker. So, so we corrected a bit. And we see that those guys, they, they work in the day as well, and a bit in the night, but then in really early in the morning, they seem to sleep as well. Um, so this, this uh, phase of uh, manual exploitation, so we found uh, 8,000 8, um, interactive sessions collected. Uh, they were uploading uh, using known or non web shells. Um, so in average, the session is only five uh, minutes, right? So it's so kind of maybe not automated, but uh, the, the, they seem to not wasting too much time on, on one thing, right? They seem to be uh, like uh, really uh, know what they do um, or repeat, probably uh, reusing the same script or same things. They don't waste too much time on, on a single machine. Uh, only nine sessions lasted more than one hour. Um, so we, we looked at the commands from the logs uh, we got, and 60% uh, of them actually were uploading some files, um, and 50% of them tried to modify some existing files, like maybe trying to deface uh, uh, some files. So most of the time they were not able to modify a lot of files because we really constrained their uh, rights. So then we try to, to um, understand the goals uh, of the attackers. Um, <coughs> so uh, we try to make some clustering of the files we collected, right? So we collected a lot of files there. Um, I don't have the number in mind. Um, but then we, we did some, um, some correlation using the fuzzy hashes. So uh, a fuzzy hash, uh, I don't know who knows what's a fuzzy hash. Okay. Um, so, so basically, uh, you know what's, who knows what's a cryptographic hash? No one? <laughs> okay, <laughs> everyone's sleeping, sorry. Uh, so basically, a fuzzy hash, um, so a fuzzy hash, uh, so a cryptographic hash, if you have two files that are slightly different, you get two different cryptographic hash, right? And then you'll be able to tell they are different, right? If you have two files that are exactly the same, you get exactly the same cryptographic hash, and you're able to say they are exactly the same. But if one bit change, you can't notice it, right? So a fuzzy hash is a hash that is going to help to, to give you a way to give um, similarity factor between two files, right? So if there is one file that is slightly modified, uh, if, you compare it, if you compare two files and one is slightly modified, then you'll be able to say basically, oh, it looks like 80% similar, right? And this is very useful because um, lots of those uh, web shells, for example, they're open source and they're modified and some people have their own custom versions or some botnets or whatever. And there is a lot of customization and exchange of this. Or, so we find a lot of, uh, we can cluster them by, by manually flagging some files like that. We can say, okay, this group is a web shell and this group is a botnet and this group is, is this, okay? So, um, <coughs> so uh, we're able to find like a second stage uh, um, defacement, a big part of them defacement, um, some spam or leak, leak, uh, link farming, and so on. Uh, so this is an example of um, um, clustering of uh, web shells, for example. Okay, so uh, this is an overview of the results we got on, on this uh, uh, web honeypot. Um, so basically the study we, we did is confirming some, some new known trends, right? Uh, that, okay, a lot of attacks from Eastern Europe, um, scam on phishing campaigns uh, running from Africa, so we found that as well. Um, and that very commonly uh, the, the spam on the, on, the web, on, the, on the forums were for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical advertisements, all that we've been studied before. Um, we found some surprising results uh, that we actually had a high, high number of manual attacks. Right? Uh, so since that discovery on, on exploitation is autom automated, so you have these automated scripts that go there, and then after that, uh, you have some people going on by hand, they go and they, they, they log in on the system and so on, and they try to do something from there manually. Uh, one thing that is surprising is that uh, if you follow the botnets, um, you know that the botnets at the beginning, so we found many uh, cases of uh, botnets being loaded. Uh, of course, they were blocked because we didn't let them connect outside. But we found many uh, examples of botnets. Um, on, on before, at the beginning, botnets were bots because they were joining IRC, so this is the, the, the name. Uh, botnets come from, from this. Uh, but since many years, it's known that botnets are not distributed. They use peer-to-peer -peer 
or maybe Tor or whatever more advanced things, right? And there we spoon a lot of botnets, a lot of botnets that, for example, compromise on OS commerce and then steal uh, credit card numbers, and then they join uh, IRC channel. Right? So there's still a lot of them doing this, and that was kind of surprising for us. Um, <coughs> and uh, yeah, the thing is that the attacks we saw there were mostly targeting already known vulnerable things, right? The OS commerce vulnerability that was very well known, for example. Uh, and um, the thing is that they are very simple attacks, but are, in terms of volume, that's pretty large. Right? And we're not expecting that volume. <coughs> uh, so so uh, this is the conclusion for the first part. Uh, and uh, one thing that we noticed and that surprised us as well during this study is that um, we had quite some trouble with uh, the hosting facilities. Right? So we had those websites that were just proxies, right? On, on, this, uh, on some web hosting facilities. And uh, many of them complained of uh, our activities. And uh, some actually closed our accounts. And we thought that, that's surprising, right? Uh, we're surprised that, first, we are not doing anything bad. We we're just compromised. So some people were compromising us. And then once they, we got compromised, we were containing them. So they were not like propagating on their systems. There was never any file stored on, on their own servers, right? Uh, because everything was forwarded directly to us. Um, so we thought, okay, that's, that's surprising. Uh, they are detecting those attacks, maybe. Um, because, yeah, they were complaining, okay, this is malicious activity, so we drop your, your, your account. So, yeah, maybe they care about their customer security. This is good. Uh, that would be great, right? And so we thought, okay, but maybe we can check this. And so that's, that's the, the, the second paper we published, on, which is called, and that's the half the second half of the, the main title, the, the role of the web hosting providers in detecting compromised websites, right? Um, on, so this paper, we actually um, had more motivations once we started the idea to do this. So first, those uh, cheap web hosting is used by millions of people, right? There are millions of simple web hosting, right? Shared web hosting. Um, hosting personal websites, uh, small business websites, they take often a web application, a forum, uh, whatever, and they drop it there, and they, they let it run. Um, they very often have no security background. They are not really developers, right? They just take an application and put it there. Uh, and even the thing is worse is that when you have such um, uh, simple web hosting, uh, if you know about security, if you want to monitor your, your, your website, you have very little access to it, right? You, you can't see, most of the time, you don't get access to the Apache logs or you don't get access to the system. So you don't see much uh, of what's happening there on those shared web hosting, right? Uh, you can't secure the, the server itself, for example, right? Um, so there are millions of websites, non-experienced users, uh, sometimes with audited or vulnerable web apps, and that's, that's a huge attack surface, right? So maybe there is a huge problem there. Um, so we expect from those hosting providers to do something for the security of this, right? That, that, would, be, uh, that would be great. And the question is, is it the case? <coughs> so we, we should su su study this. Um, if uh, those web hosting providers detect the compromise, um, uh, we want as well to do something else, to test the reaction when you complain, right? Sometimes they receive complaints. So the, the reason why are they blocking those websites is maybe just because they received some complaints. We don't know. So, so uh, in addition to this, we found that there are some services you can purchase uh, that are independent from the web hosting provider. But uh, those services, they are security services. So we call them add-on security services. I'm not sure that's the real name of them, a generic name. So they basically you pay one company to monitor your website and you expect them to, you pay them for, for them to check the security and tell you if there is some problem, right? That's a good thing, right? Uh, so um, they're not too expensive and, and we actually uh, choose them uh, because we look at those shared web hosting. It doesn't make sense to pay 300 euro or 1,000 euro per month for, for the security service, right? So we, we took them at 30 euro maximum, right? Otherwise you would not use shared uh, web hosting. <coughs> so, um, again, uh, for testing this, what we did is we registered multiple shared hosting accounts. Uh, there we installed some real uh, web applications. And then on those web applications that we de deployed ourselves, 
we simulated some compromise scenarios, right? So we installed some applications and then we try to simulate infection by a botnet, we try to simulate an SQL injection, we try to simulate a phishing kit, we actually install a phishing kit, right? Um, including code, a drive by download, uh, uh, like having um, compromised accounts, so someone that's like, for example, uploading files with FTP or SSH to, to, the, uh, to the account. Uh, and then we, we made those tests to be really easily detectable, right? Noisy. So <coughs> we actually um, tested all of them to uh, either be detected by antivirus or by a WASP rule or by whatever, web application firewalls, uh, uh, IDS, IPS, uh, etc. Um, <coughs> so we did this in two phases. First, for 25 days, uh, we simulated the compromise, right? So we installed the system and then set it up and then simulated the compromise. And then the second phase, we actually sent abuse complaints. Right? So uh, the thing is that we're a bit nasty because we sent some real complaints about some real security problems. So we say, oh, there is a phishing page there. And we send this to the, to the web hosting provider. But what we did as well is that we sent illegitimate uh, complaints. Like we said, hey, there is a web page here serving malware while the page is clean. Right? Uh, that was just to, to test the reaction and see if they actually react properly, right? Are they always closing the website even when it's clean? This is the, the, the thing we wanted to check. Um, <coughs> so there are a few ethical is issues um, because we used some real vulnerabilities, some real phishing kits, some real uh, drive-by download JavaScript code, right? Um, so um, it's not nice to put this online. Uh, <laughs> on, on uh, those uh, services. So what we did is that we modified each so that there is no possible harm, right? So we modified, for example, the, like to have some special parameters. So this attack will only work if you provide this random number as a parameter uh, so that no one will be um, uh, harmed by it. Or uh, we made the, the websites not to be indexed by the, by the crawlers, by Google, for example. So it's not on Google, right? So someone will not find it by chance, right? Um, and the malicious content was not made accessible from the web, for example. Right? Um, so from there, we selected the providers. So we picked 12 uh, big uh, providers, big names, uh, mostly that are US companies. Uh, then we, because that's, that's uh, one side of the market, I would say, we picked 10 smaller ones that sort of have regional or, or country size uh, businesses. Um, we choose them, 10 of them uh, across many places in the world. On, those, on six uh, add-on services, so those services you pay for having a, a security service. Um, on them, we, we pick them that, that are below 30 euro, right? As I said, it doesn't make sense to pay 300 euro for protecting a 10 euro uh, hosting plan. Um, some have a basic on the pro version, pro being a bit more expensive. Uh, and we, we only analyze them for, for 10 days, right? We only gave 10 days, 10 days for them to react. That's, that's already um, quite a bit. So um, then we, we set up several scenarios. Um, infection by a botnet, I uh, mentioned them a bit already. Uh, data exfiltration with an SQL injection, phishing kit, code inclusion, and compromised accounts. Um, so the bot test case, um, basically we simulate a, a botnet activity, right? So um, we make a OS commerce uh, installation with a modification, and then we load, uh, two, we, ha we have two executable files, an IRC client compiled for 32 and 64 bits architectures, on a PHP script uh, executing the right uh, binary depending on the machine configuration. <coughs> Uh, the IRC client is connecting to a fake IRC server that we run. Um, so there is no real, it's not really a malicious. Uh, and then every hour, we run the attack. We upload the HT, uh, PHP file um, with the two binaries. And uh, we do this via FTP, like if the account was compromised. And then we launch the IRC client on issue of, with the, the um, issuing the, the PHP, um, I mean, going to the PHP page. So this is one uh, attack. Uh, the other one is an SQL injection. So again, uh, it's an OS commerce um, with a known SQL injection vulnerability. Um, <coughs> so we, we um, modified it so that it returns some um, data that looks legitimate, like 
fake credit card numbers and fake, fake uh, personal identification uh, numbers so that on the network it looks like a real SQL injection. And then the attack everywhere, we do a few GET requests that uh, simulate uh, an SQL injection, um, <coughs> um, hitting a customer table. And then, um, uh, what's the... <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, we, we try to, to see, um, uh, to use a few SQL uh, reserved keywords to see if there is some rules that, that block those, uh, those HTTP requests. Um, <coughs> um, then we, we tested a phishing kit. So basically, we took um, a real phishing kit for, uh, I think it was, it's not written there, uh, Bank of America, it's written. Uh, so we took this Bank of America phishing kit um, um, with uh, OS Commerce, again, with a, a, a real uh, remote file upload vulnerability. On this phishing kit, uh, we disable the backend code, right? So even if someone, by miracle, gets on this web page, he's not going to be able to actually submit his bank details, right? Um, <coughs> however, the files are still, uh, uh, I mean, most of the files are still the, the unmodified. Um, so every six hours, uh, the attacker that we simulate uploads the phishing kit by using the vulnerability. On uh, every 15, 15 minutes, we simulate a victim that is falling into the, the trap and types some fake uh, banking details or login accounts. Um, <coughs> and then we, um, yeah, the forms on the phishing pages are, are filled with some, some pre, um, prepared some data, prepared data. So uh, we simulate then a compromised account. Uh, there is a simple website with a static page. And then uh, we have some malicious files, so a PHP shell, um, a web shell, and uh, a Ramnit worm, so a non malicious executable. Both are detected by most antivirus. And the attack is that um, we, we upload those files with FTP, assuming that the attacker stole some credentials. And we do this every six hours. Uh, last one. Uh, the web shell. Um, <coughs> so again, uh, remote file, uh, file upload vulnerability in uh, OS Commerce. And um, we upload this uh, web shell uh, regularly. Um, and we simulate someone using it. So it was a bit long description of, of uh, those attacks. But uh, then we run the attacks, right? And for running the attacks, what we do, um, so that it looks legitimate, we actually uh, use some VPNs to have a different set of IP addresses, right? We don't want to look always everything coming from the same place. So we have a set of IP addresses that are only used for performing the attacks. Uh, for the phishing test case, we have a set of IP address that is only used by the victims. And then we have some normal visitors uh, that we basically uh, do to simulate some, some normal usage of the website. So it looks a real website. Um, okay, and so for the results, so the first thing um, that we were surprised a bit about is that uh, there is, I mean, the registration was a bit more difficult than we expected, right? And then we'll see that some prevent some, prevent some attacks, uh, some, we see what, how they uh, detect the compromise on some results of the attack complaints. So the registration actually, um, it was, uh, it was sometimes difficult to make uh, those registrations. Uh, after a few uh, websites you register on the same provider, they start to ask you a lot of details, right? Uh, phone, they make some phone calls, calls to verify the identity, um, ask for an ID, they ask for, um, they have third party protection uh, services where they will correlate your IP addresses with the billing address you give or the credit card number and so on. And our IP address was not giving the same place as we were actually, so it was problems for us. Um, we found that those global providers, like that were uh, very big on covering multiple countries, are paying more attention to this, right? Um, <coughs> uh, half of them actually verified manually some, some of our accounts. Uh, and there was a lot less for the, the small uh, regional uh, providers. Um, <coughs> And there were some regional providers with very simple uh, registration process. <coughs> so then for uh, the prevention and detection, uh, there are some, some, um, some services that do prevent some attacks, right? So there are some URL blacklists to block SQL injections um, on file uploads. Uh, 
There are some OS level filtering, right? So for example, the, the botnet is prevented from connecting back to the to the to the um, to the botmaster to the, the IRC uh, channel. That's good. Um, <coughs> they seem to have some commercial uh, rules uh, that are used by the by several uh, providers. Um, but the, the detection uh, results are, are not as good. Uh, only one. Uh, only one provider was able to detect something, one of our attack, uh, and we received the alert for uh, the antivirus test like 17 days after. Right? So in terms of prevention, so we see some some um, blocked um, uh, requests, um, some that were partially blocked. So typically for SQL injection, um, uh, we we had some some. Um, uh, some SQL, SQL requests were obfuscated. Right? And then once they were obfuscated, uh, they were not blocked anymore. <coughs> so uh, for the abuse complaints, 50% um, uh, of the providers never replied to any notification. Right? So when we send an abuse request, they, they don't reply. 64% uh, reply of, of the replies arrive within one day, so that's for the so that's half of the other, uh, that's a quarter, more or less. Um, the global providers answer faster than the original ones. And the, there was a wide, wide variety of reactions. Um, uh, for the real abuse handling, so you see half of them do not reply. Uh, and then uh, only 14% of them reply satisfyingly, which means some actually overreact. Uh, for example, you had a malicious web uh, file uh, on you got compromised, maybe you had a malicious file, and then they will just uh, cut the, the user account, right? terminate the account. And that's, that's too much, right? They could just send an email and tell, okay, you have some malicious files there, clean this, or, or they go and they remove completely the files, and that's not very nice. Um, <coughs> some actually sent some ultimatum saying, oh yeah, you have a problem, you should do something about it, and then we don't do anything, and, and then they don't do anything. <laughs> so they complain once, and then if you don't do anything, they, they let you with your malware on, on the, the, the web server. That, that's pretty bad as well, right? They don't go, they don't, uh, so nothing happens. So for the illegitimate abuse notification, 14% um, of, uh, 14 out of 19 uh, behaved well, which includes those that didn't reply. So it's not, uh, it's not, okay, it's an overestimation, right? Um, <clears throat> so there were some that actually believed the complaints without checking, so they terminate their accounts, for example, or they remove some files, while the files were not malicious. There was no malicious activity on, on, the, on, on, the, on the website. And they took really the completely wrong decisions for that, right? This is, this is uh, terrible. Um, and then uh, the study we, we, we did on, on the web security uh, add-on services, so those, uh, I told you, we, we run for 10 days separately. Uh, and there we, we have the same kind of uh, attacks, right, on, on the services. So they should have been able to detect them, right? And five out of six services didn't detect anything, anything. And one detected, detected some things. Um, a malicious file, uh, there was an antivirus file, on, on antivirus scan, and they found it, but they didn't notify the user. So you pay them, you have a user account there, they find uh, something, but they don't send you an email or tell you, right? So you have to go to the web, their web interface to say, oh yeah, I have a malicious file there. Um, <clears throat> and they find the blacklisted malicious pages, so, so they use a blacklisting URL service, and we, we, we got ourselves uh, listed there. So um, to conclude, um, there is quite a lot to prevent uh, malicious registrations, uh, especially from global providers. Um, the main idea behind, I believe, is to protect their revenue, because maybe if there are some malicious black people are using stolen credit cards, maybe, or this kind of thing, and they never get paid. Um, <coughs> most providers do have basic mechanisms to prevent uh, uh, some kind of attacks, uh, typically this URL blacklists. Uh, but there is um, zero effort done in detecting obvious signs of compromise. Uh, the bad news is that the cheap security services are really useless. I mean, 
those we tested on in these conditions, I'm not saying they, they don't do anything, but in, in our case, they were not um, uh, useful. Um, half of the companies only respond to the complaints uh, on 14% in a, a not appropriate way. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is it for our study. Uh, I have the big table with all the results if you want to see some details. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, pretty long. It's in the paper if you want. There is every, all the details. And basically, when it's, when it's a black dot, it's good. So there is a lot of white. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. And if there is any question. So, so this is one of the possible conclusion of, of the study, is that uh, of the both actually when we put them together, uh, it's one explanation why we got so much trouble with the first study to get those web proxies to work for our honeypots is maybe not because there was some malicious traffic there, but just because there was some traffic, right? So they see some traffic, they see a cheap web hosting for not a lot of money, taking a lot of traffic, right? So they have a look, because there is some, take some bandwidth, and some resources on the servers, and then they say, hey, this is expensive for us and brings not so much money, so let's get rid of them. Oh, it's malicious, so it's very easy. Okay, so I think it's, it's an explanation, right? Maybe, Maybe you get flagged because something big happens, right? We had a lot of traffic, right? Like in total it was 10 gigabytes of data or thousands of requests and so on. So, so maybe we got flagged because it was doing some traffic on there. They look at you and say, hey, can we get rid of that one? It's taking some bandwidth. So, so maybe this, this is an explanation. Uh, then we didn't test to do some denial of service on those providers, right? That would have been too much, right? Uh, <laughs> so that remains a conjecture. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So you got the difference between the, the first half, right? You said that, uh, as I was saying that question, that um, you got um, no reaction when you deliberately set up the economy bonds, but you did get one. Uh, when you didn't set up, have you then followed that up by making your honeypots deliberately have lots of traffic? Because that would seem to be the, the test for why the first was different to the second. You mean the honeypot to have little traffic, so it doesn't get... Lots of traffic. Because if oh, the second study, you mean to... Yeah, no, we didn't, but maybe that could have been a, an idea. Because then you'd have, you could use the first as a yes. control, and the, the second was the... This is, this is true, we didn't do that. Right. Uh, another thing that we didn't do, and that's something we figure out later, uh, afterwards, uh, is that in the first case, we got uh, the websites indexed by Google. Right. So Google indexed them. Right. So Google maybe, if there is something vulnerable or malicious, maybe gets that into uh, their blacklisting. Right. And maybe the hosting providers, they monitor this, and they see if there is something that is on there, hosting facilities, they, they flag it. While on the other case, we did install I mean, some malicious pages and we made everything so that Google doesn't index it. Yeah. Uh, that's another difference, right? So maybe this is, I mean, I don't know, maybe we need to design different tests to, to, to see if one possibility really is that those hosting providers, they only rely on Google for, their, for the security of what the, the page they serve, right? Yeah, so it sounds like there's a third phase where you could use some control mechanisms, some controls, uh, in order to detect what the differences really were, etc. Yes, and yeah. Much, so, yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Also present the, the um. results to the uh, to the hosting providers. Uh, uh, yeah. No, we didn't. Uh, we presented it at an academic conference where uh, I don't know. Yeah. We didn't, but <laughs> yeah, maybe it's. Would be good to do. Yeah. Maybe then, then they will make I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think okay. Like there are like business, right? On the business, they they protect their revenue, right? That's the main. You know, in telecom, the telecom world, the the fraud team. They are not called fraud teams, right? They're called revenue assurance, right? <laughs> in telecom companies. So, yes. 
If you had to choose one provider, which one will you choose today? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll anonymize this on the... Actually, the student did an anonymization and I didn't... Uh, so I, I, I don't, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't remember e even the, the names of the providers. I probably have the data somewhere if you really want to know. <laughs> I can't find it, I guess. You, you published the name of the providers? No, we didn't. Why? <sighs> I mean, the, the, the goal was not to do some figure pointing, but to do a global study, right? So, I don't know, yeah. How are the security companies? How did you expect the security companies to be able to detect the attacks? Did you some kind of forward the HTTP log to them? Uh, you mean those... Um, like the reverse proxy or... Uh, you expect them to, to scan your website every day? Those add-on services, right? This, yes. the add-on services. Yes, so uh, basically... Um, I'm not sure anymore of which uh, subset of the test did we... We have it here? No. So uh, it's another figure. Um, we made so we made tests that they should be able to detect, right? Uh, if if I mean, uh, I don't remember exactly the details, but basically they had they, you give them the login and password for the system, right? Uh, for the web hosting, so they have the account, so they can do testing from the web, right? But they can do testing from the file system, right? So they can get and fetch all the files, and they can they should be able to detect that there is this uh, malicious binary there, the the Ramit worm, for example or the PHP shell, right? They should detect the PHP shell if they, they have access to the files. Right? So None of the services were something like a reverse proxy that you go to the reverse proxy of security company no. for what CPU, or that you send to your... No, no, the, the, the pages are really... Or something like that. The, 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 the pages are served from, from, the, from the hosting company and the, the security, security services are independent companies, third parties. Right? So I think in maybe in one or two cases, I'm not sure if... So in one or two cases, there were some some um, there were some uh, some hosting providers that were actually advertising some security services like that. But I think they did it right after we finished the study. Unrelated, but I mean, it's the, yeah, they charged some something for for this service, but that one we didn't test. So yeah. for sure, it would be more efficient because it's easier if it's the same company, right? Of course. Yeah. Yes. What were the security guarantees provided for these security add-ons? Uh, I don't think they provided so many guarantees, right? They, 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 they promised some. They promised that they will do something, right? And they didn't, they didn't do. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.